Hello. Uh, in the next uh, 50 minutes or so, I'll try to cover gallbladder and bile duct tumor pathology, uh, focusing mostly on the challenging aspects in daily surgical pathology practice. Um, I will start with the definition of dysplasia, the different types of dysplasia and their clinical pathologic significance, especially of the distinct types. Um, then uh, I'll go over the um, criteria for reactive versus dysplastic changes, then in terms of uh, invasiveness and how we define invasive carcinomas. And finally, I will go over some of the more subtle forms of invasive adenocarcinomas that we encounter in daily practice. Let's start with conventional intraepithelial neoplasia. And when I say conventional, I mean the flat type, incidental types of dysplasia, meaning things that we encounter microscopically in specimens removed typically for other reasons. And there's dysplastic changes, which we also call intraepithelial neoplasia. And these conventional types of uh, intraepithelial neoplasia also referred as flat type, because as you will see, we distinguish these from more the tumoral types of intraepithelial neoplasia. Uh, in terms of terminology, um, bilin was the term proposed uh, for these lesions, although dysplasia is in still a more common use because bilin is, has now found the common practice. Um, and there's a spectrum of dysplastic changes, obviously. And um, as it happened in many other organs, uh, we increasingly move towards a two-tiered system in grading and dysplasia, uh, low-grade versus high-grade. And for high-grade, actually, we're um, reserving that term more to carcinoma in situ type lesions. That's why actually HGDCIS is used uh, parenthetically. So it is the upper end um, of the uh, spectrum that is closest to cancer is what we uh, call high grade dysplasia. So um, anything lesser than that is regarded as low grade dysplasia or billion one or two. Um, of course, there's uh, this is a spectrum, and it's not easy to make a determination of what is low and high. It is like um, almost uh, doing uh, weather forecast, and um, we look at a cloud and try to say whether this is going to be a rain type of cloud or not. And in some cases, of, obviously, we can tell it's imminent rain or the rain is already there. So you can regard high-grade dysplasia CIS as also rain in situ, where you can be really sure it's going to rain or you know, it has all the potentials to do so. In general practice, uh, increasingly, we uh, regard low-grade dysplastic lesions as uh, clinically insignificant. Uh, they may have some consequence in terms of they may be a marker disease or they may be a hallmark of some underlying condition. But other than that, they probably do not require any specific treatment, whereas high-grade dysplasia, which is essentially carcinoma in situ, that's why high-grade CIS, um, it's, it's typically a significant lesion. There's something else going on in the same specimen and needs to be very carefully evaluated. Um, in terms of the terms used, however, I'd like to go back to some of the uh, controversial aspects of the names. Um, we mentioned billion three and high grade dysplasia CIS carcinoma. These are terms I kind of used interchangeably, but you, I would like to make you aware that WHO does not like the term carcinoma in situ in the GI tract um, for the fear of uh, causing overtreatment. Um, they advocate using high grade dysplasia instead. Uh, whereas in Asia and South America, um, the term carcinoma is commonly used for high grade dysplastic lesions, or actually, they're even often called M, meaning mucosal type carcinoma. Um, so there's, there's this big gap that we try to bridge by using terms um, kind of parenthetically. So high-grade dysplasia, CIS. So anytime uh, I make a diagnosis of high-grade dysplasia, I also put parenthetical, or at least in the comment that I'm referring to this carcinoma in situ type process, meaning the step right before something becomes uh, truly invasive as illustrated in this diagram. As I mentioned, high-grade dysplasia often means significant and is detected incidentally, for instance, uh, next to invasive carcinoma in many of the patients with invasive cancers who find high-grade dysplasia in the mucosa. Then the question becomes, is this really truly high-grade dysplasia CIS, or could it be colonization of invasive carcinoma on the surface? Um, but we do see high-grade dysplasia convincing examples in risk conditions, meaning lesions or uh, diseases that are prone to develop cancerous transformation, especially uh, cyst, 
primary sclerosis in cholangitis and pancreatic biliary maljunction are things to be kept in mind because you see specimens with these disorders and you should be looking for uh, carcinomatous changes very carefully. For instance, in cholelocalcis, in about 15% of the patients, we see high-grade dysplasia, CIS-type changes uh, in the specimen if you sample it carefully and examine them carefully. Another disease that needs to be recognized, it's uh, relatively rare, but when it occurs, it's actually uh, very significant consequences for the uh, patient is uh, pancreatic biliary maljunction. Um, it is um, essentially the supra odi union of common bile duct and pancreatic duct. In normal, um, in normal population, uh, common bile duct and pancreatic duct come together within the OD complex. So the OD essentially prevents any reflux um, in this area. However, in the condition that we call anomalous union of pancreatic biliary duct, or uh, probably easier name, pancreatic biliary maljunction, this union takes place above the OD. So it escapes the uh, sphincteric function of OD. And that's why um, pancreatic enzymes are commonly increased in gallbladders and bile ducts of these patients. And not only that, there is 200 times risk of cancer formation. Again, this is a rare condition, but when it happens, the risk is uh, incredibly high for the patient. About 8% of gallbladder cancers are attributable to this, uh, this disorder, uh, the, this variant. Um, and um, the, um, the common bile duct cancers are also uh, often arising in this, but the specific uh, frequency is not exactly known as of yet. So with this, uh, we come to tumoral types of intraepithelial neoplasia. And what do we mean by that? Uh, let's take a case, for example. This was an 80-year-old female uh, presented with abdominal pain. An MRI showed the gallbladder mass, and this mass had some interesting characteristics. It was large and complex, but um, and it look, did look like cancer, but it was demarcated and smooth contoured, and it was filling the lumen, uh, which is an unusual finding. And you see here, indeed, um, the wall of the gallbladder is relatively preserved, but filling the lumen is this friable granular material. Um, and in the first 20 blocks, this friable material translated to uh, the papillary anomatous lesion, uh, compact back-to-back -back papillary units uh, with dysplastic changes um, and confined to the mucosa, uh, essentially intraluminal process. And here we see the same tumor with more tubular configuration in some areas of the lesion. Uh, and again, you're looking at the native epithelium preserved, and this is kind of a polypoid papillary projection into the lumen. The native epithelium is not involved uh, in this focus. Um, so this is an intraepithelial or intraluminal growth. If we have only the papillary component of this lesion, uh, and if this was occurring in the bile ducts, we will designate this as intraductal papillary neoplasm of the bile ducts. It's a, this would be a textbook picture of an IPMB. And in the pancreas, we'll regard this as an IPMN, introductal papillary mucinous neoplasms. And I'll go over some of these terms um, later on. And in, indeed, in this case, some areas were more tubular, as you see here, and still carcinomatous, high-grade dysplasia, obviously, with lots of architectural and cytologic complexity, evident even in this power. And um, if we had only this area uh, in the bile ducts, for instance, we'll call this intraductal tubular papillary or intraductal tubular neoplasm of the bile duct, or in the pancreas also, uh, we'll have regarded that uh, and, and that name. Um, so in the first 20 blocks of this case, we could not find any invasion. So in a case like this, uh, I don't need to tell you that extensive sampling, actually entire sampling of the lesion is warranted because you don't want to miss an invasive carcinoma, which will change the prognosis dramatically. Uh, so we took another set of 20 blocks. We go stepwise because of practicality purposes. You don't want to put uh, 80 blocks and then find out that there were invasive carcinoma all over the place. So you really oversampled it. So stepwise approach may delay the case a little bit, but it's much more practical in many aspects. Um, so in this uh, second set of 20, we found this uh, four millimeter focus of invasive carcinoma. Uh, 
um, as, uh, which was at the T2 level. Then, of course, we sampled a lot more sections just to make sure we have dealing with only T2 and that there's no T3 carcinoma. So really extensive sampling is uh, required for these lesions. And the final diagnosis in this case was that it was an invasive adenocarcinoma. It was four millimeter, it was PT2, meaning crossing the muscularis. And it was arising in an intracholecystic papillary tubular neoplasm. And I'll discuss these in a little bit more detail in a minute, but I just would like to emphasize that we provide a synoptic report based on the invasive component of the lesion, meaning size of invasive carcinoma, perineal invasion, vascular invasion, margin status, both for inside to invasive components. Um, and if there's no invasive component, of course, you have to document the inside to components characteristics in detail. So this case actually is an example of what we call tumoral forms of intraepithelial neoplasia or um, another approach or another way to look at it is these are mass forming pre-invasive neoplasms. Um, so they are not invasive per se themselves. Of course, they can lead to invasive carcinoma, but nature, they are um, non-invasive, pre-invasive, and they form tumors, masses as seen in this example. Um, so there, uh, this flat versus tumoral distinction is similar to what we know in other organs, for instance, in the cervix, we have CIN-SAL concept, which kind of translates to these flat non-tumoral forms of dysplasia, whereas clonic adenomas are the uh, classical examples of the adenoma carcinoma sequence or tumoral forms of intrapithelial neoplasia. And we have, this concept is actually very well established in the urethidium as well, both molecularly and by biologic behavior. They are very distinct flat type CIS versus papillary uh, ranging from puna lump to low grade papillary neoplasms to high grade. So if you do general uh, surgical pathology and if you do um, uh, urinary pathology, uh, you will be familiar with these uh, entities that are uh, quite distinct from each other. In the pancreas and biliary tract, this, these two types are becoming increasingly recognized and characterized. Panin, um, just uh, illustrating more flat or microscopic flat, meaning we're referring to not tumor forming. It is a microscopic incidental uh, type of dysplasia, whereas IPMNs, IRPNs, ITPNs, again, we'll discuss a little bit more, um, are the ones that form tumors by themselves. Um, so tumoral types of intraepithelial neoplasia. There are various, various entities that fall into this umbrella category. There are common themes to these. They're again, pre-invasive, mass forming, et cetera, but there are local differences. So an ITPN, for instance, can occur any part of the pancreas to biliary tract, but shows differences from pancreas to bile duct to upper bile ducts, for instance. And there are different types, cellular differences. Um, as you will see, there's an alphabet soup of entities, uh, various groups. Some of them are really important to remember because they are different than the rest. So let me try to go over these um, complex group of lesions. Um, let's start with those that are papillary villus configuration. Uh, in the pancreas, these are um, referred as IPMN. Uh, in the bile ducts, we call these intraductal papillary neoplasms of bile ducts, IPMB. Um, and in the gallbladder, they are called intracholecystic papillary or papillary tubular neoplasms, ICPNs. Um, and these ICPNs in the gallbladder, meaning intracholecystic papillary tubular neoplasms, uh, form a spectrum of architectural uh, patterns and cell lineages. So they can be papillary tubular, a complex papillary tubular. It can have a mixture of gastric looking with pancreatobiliary looking with intestinal looking lesions. Unlike in the IPMNs in the pancreas, they are not rigid uh, lines of lineage that occur in a given patient. There's often a big mixture of different things that occur uh, in the gallbladder. And there's also a new uh, subset of these lesions uh, that's being recognized. It's called mural ICPN, meaning it's occurring on the wall. Instead of in the uh, native mucosa, we bump into these on the wall. And when you examine them carefully, you, you realize they're actually arising in fundic adenomyomas. Here's a nice example of this entity, an adenomyoma. Usually the mucosa of the gallbladder is preserved, and there's this uh, nodular lesion that translates to papillary uh, mucinous uh, cystic structures, just like in branch duct IPMNs of the pancreas. Um, 
And if you take this in uh, uh, the papillary units and put them in the mucosa, we'll call these ICPNs. So these are mural ICPNs or uh, intracholesterol neoplasms arising in adenomyomas. There's a spectrum. Some of them are more cystic and less complex, less atypical, whereas others are uh, significantly um, architectural complexity and uh, cytologic uh, atypia with extensive high-grade dysplasia and cystic carcinoma. And in about 15%, invasive carcinomas are also detected in these adenomyoma-associated intracholecystic neoplasms. So these were the papillar lesions, uh, conventional, you know, IPMN, IPNB type things that are occurring in the uh, gallbladder. We call them ICPN. Um, when we come to oncocytic examples, and it's important to remember this, uh, oncocytic examples that are papillary, actually these are very distinct. In the pancreas, they were for a while under the IPMN category as oncocytic variant, but now we regard them as a separate entity, as IOPN. Actually, when we had first described it, that's what we had proposed, IOPN as a distinct entity, intraductal oncocytic papular neoplasm, because it has very different uh, biologic behavior and um, also morphologic characteristics. And in the bile ducts, they were also later on described, and again, in the bile ducts also, they are now being recognized as a distinct group. Um, they are characterized by oncostic cells with abundant acetophilic granular cytoplasm, single prominent nucleolus. Um, this intraepithelial lumina formation, these punched out spaces are fairly characteristic um, and common finding in these tumors. And another important aspect is they're very complex arborizing papillae. It's not quite villous, side-by-side uh, -side, uh, papillar formation, but really arborizing tree-like configuration, uh, often with edema in the papillary course, is very distinctive aspect of these IOPNs. And um, again, it's important to recognize these because they're often very complex. They get labeled as cyst adenocarcinoma radiologically, and they can look infiltrative to the neighboring organs, but actually their prognosis is very good. Very few tumor-related mortalities attributable to this lesion. 10-year survival is about 90%, despite their um, uh, relatively ugly appearance or uh, infiltrative characteristics. And recently, um, uh, PRKA, CA, uh, and CA, and P because ACB uh, mutations were found in these lesions, and they do not show KRAS or GNAS mutations that are common in other forms of tumor intraepithelial neoplasm. So molecularly, they seem to be distinct as well. <clears throat> um, and this brings us to the group that has more tubular pyloric gland This tubular and pyloric gland appearing examples are well characterized in the pancreas and um, they're collected under the uh, category of IPMN. So it's kind of regarded as those pyloric gland normal like lesions in the pancreas are regarded as part of the IPMN category. And same is true also for the bile ducts that are collected under the IPNB category. Whereas in the gallbladder, um, they are kind of collected in two different groups. Um, ICPNs, the papillary neoplasms, which can have a um, fair amount of pyloric gland appearance, although they often have a mixture of other things. Um, but sometimes the predominant pattern is pyloric gland, and they have been also called pyloric gland adenoma, although there are, again, a lot of overlaps and um, common characteristics. So in the uh, gallbladder, they still remain under two uh, separate names, if you will. <clears throat> And then there are tubular examples without mucin formation. So the cells, I mean, they may have kind of mucin-like cytoplasm, but they don't have mucin per se. They're not pyloric gland mucin appearance. And these are called intraductal tubular or intraductal tubular papillary neoplasms. Um, call them tubular papillary because they have focal papillary formation, but actually um, their main defining characteristic is that they are predominantly tubular and non-mucinous uh, pre-invasive mass forming neoplasia. And these are called intraductal tubular papillary neoplasm, both in the pancreas and the bile ducts. When we come to the gallbladder, uh, an entity that's not yet recognized in the WHO uh, comes into play in this organ. It's very different than the uh, examples in the bile ducts. Actually, uh, the counterpart of this entity that I will just um, show you, illustrate to you, 
uh, does not really occur in the uh, bile ducts and the pancreas. It is a gallbladder specific process. It's a um, tubular complex preinvasive neoplasm that is without any mucin. Um, and it has distinctive characteristics, especially they form uh, pedunculated, as you see here, pedunculated lobulated polyps, the collections of tiny small tubular uh, elements that are back-to-back uh, -back and very uh, cellular appearing. There are microcysts you can see um, in the um, punctuating the uh, nodules, and they often have a very nice thin stalk, and often some of these uh, elements, the uh, nodules get detached and dismissed as debris in the lumen of the uh, of the gallbladder. And uh, this is uh, what we propose to call intracholecystic tubular non mucinous neoplasms. Uh, and the interesting thing is they're almost never invasive. We have not been able to find an example that has invasive adenocarcinoma, unlike ICPNs, which are invasive in 70 per 80% of the cases. Here are some uh, more examples of this intracholecystic tubular neoplasm, ICTN. Um, in the old literature, some examples of this were also called complex non-mucinous pilar gland adenomas as well. Um, and again, this is not yet uh, recognized in the WHO, but it is clearly a distinct entity. Uh, we're looking for an invasive carcinoma. We have not been able to find one. Very distinctive tubular configuration, nodular architecture. Some can have fair amount of cytological atypia. Virtually all of them need to be classified as high-grade dysplasia CIS because of the complex and cytologic changes. And interesting thing is the morals are uh, very... Uh, um, Characteristic seen about 60, 70%. Actually, if you sample enough and look carefully, it probably is going to be even higher than that. Um, and these morals, meningothelial like clusters, squamoid morals, whichever way you want to label them, are uh, quite distinctive in this entity. Um, they have beta cutin nuclear expression, especially in these morals, in some cases also in the main lesion. But typically, beta cutin highlights these morular. Uh, regions and these are MUX positive. So uh, it looks like they do have some pyloric gland differentiation. Now, so these, um, in, the, in terms of the uh, tumoral intraepithelial neoplasms, uh, there are important things to remember um, that the non invasive examples are curable in most cases. However, there are those that um, progress, and presumably because there's under sampling and they were invasive and the invasion missed, but some of them seem to be uh, really uh, kind of a hallmark of uh, cancer risk in the biliary tract. So uh, sometimes eight, 10 years later after the diagnosis and invasive, non-invasive example, suddenly uh, biliary tract cancer develops as probably a, a field effect phenomenon. Um, invasive carcinomas arising from these adenomatous type lesions are important to note because they have better prognosis, even it seems when you stage match with ordinary adenocarcinomas, meaning even deep examples seem to have a different biology and be uh, better than the ordinary adenocarcinoma. So it's important to notate the um, non-invasive component in such cases that this is arising from an uh, tumoral intraepithelial neoplasm like ICPN or IPMB, um, uh, so that you know the the prognosis could be different. And I would like to emphasize again that there are variants of these tumoral intraepithelial neoplasms that are distinct, and um, this this these graphs do not apply to IOPNs, the oncocytic ones. Really, despite their complexity, most of them are. Uh, curable by complete removal. And again, the intracholecystic tubular non-mucinous neoplasms are uh, almost invariably non-invasive. We have not been able to find a convincing invasive example of that entity. So how do we approach to these papillary polypoid neoplasms? The most important thing is to rule out invasive carcinoma. So you have to sample really entirely. I mean, uh, because there's no way to tell uh, invasion by gross examination and their complex lesions without complete examination, we cannot exclude invasive carcinoma. And once you find invasion, it's important to document its extent and characteristic staging, perineural, vascular, uh, the whole nine yards of uh, cancer synoptics. In non-invasive cancers, cases especially, it is important to document the degree of dysplasia, the growth patterns, the cellular features to the best you can. It's not always easy because often there are mixtures and 
Um, so we try to notate the uh, combination uh, percentages of different cell types, for instance. Um, and it's also important to examine the non-lesional um, organ, non-lesional gallbladder, non-lesional bile duct, because you can have invasive carcinoma away from the main lesion. So they're not only precursors, but they're also markers of disease. So um, it's, that's something that should be kept in mind. Of course, margin status needs to be documented. And again, there are these variants that need to be kept in mind because um, putting them in um, in the, in the general uh, basket uh, may need them to be managed and treated uh, unfairly. <clears throat> so now uh, we come to differential diagnosis of high-grade dysplasia carcinoma in situ from other types of atypia that unfortunately occurs commonly uh, in the gallbladder and biliary tract. Here is one um, common occurrence, uh, focal basophilic epithelial atypia, is what we call them, uh, these kind of patches of blueness, if you will, especially in gallbladders, but also in bile ducts, you see, um, and then you wonder if this could be dysplasia because it stands out, as you can see in these um, highlighted areas, it really stands out. And when you look at it, uh, you get the impression there's stratification, there's a basophilic appearance, nuclei, etc. So is this a reparative atypia? Is this uh, ATP of undetermined significance? Is this dysplasia? If so, what grade? And could this be even invasive adenocarcinoma and detaching from the uh, epithelium? So um, this particular example, actually, we have uh, taken through um, a long travel, if you will. Uh, in 2003, when I first saw this um, slide, I called this low-grade dysplasia. I wasn't sure it was too stratified and blue and atypical appearing to my eye. And um, I even uh, phrased the concern for high-grade dysplasia. So it was kind of undetermined, but I'm concerned type of uh, diagnosis. But um, since then, after doing lots of collaborative work with our colleagues from Chile, where we see a lot of invasive carcinomas and high-grade dysplasias, when you see the real thing, some of the false things uh, settle in your mind. And um, now we regard these as a form of reactive atypia. And indeed, in an international consensus meeting, 70% um, of the experts regarded as uh, reactive. However, remainder, um, thought this could still be dysplastic. So just, there's still, of course, some subjectivity and controversy. And I'll try to share some of the criteria we developed in recognition of um, these uh, high-grade dysplasia versus reactive atypia. Here are some nice examples of um, high-grade dysplasia CIS. Typically, there's extensive and severe surface atypia. It doesn't really uh, miss your eye. Um, when you even examine it from low power, and I think a low power examination is actually crucial in making it this determination, and it should really stand out even in low power examination as an area of complexity of blueness and abnormality that is not giving up. Um, so they, it, it really stands out, it stays there, and um, it may, of course, wax and wane, but uh, still, it will show substantial atypia, and many of the um, true high-grade dysplasia CIS have substantial cytologic and architectural atypia, as you see here, overlapping, nuclear abnormalities, pleomorphism, disorganization, um, all and all the uh, attributes of cancerous transformation is typically evident. There are different cell types and could create a little bit problem with some of them. Um, most of them are more cuboidal. Um, they may have a chromophobe uh, renal cell carcinoma-like um, halo around them in some cases, uh, but nucleoli are very prominent. And again, the complexity. Some of them look almost like intestinal adenomas with the more cigar-shaped nuclei and stratification, and etc. And it's a more basophilic appearance, and a more astophilic version of this with this um, kind of uh, even more slender appearance uh, is similar to pencilate cells and bile ducts. So we uh, term these as pencilate type. And the concern is actually with this gastric or mucinous examples, which is thankfully uh, uh, of the rare type, uh, but it's important because it really looks um, very innocuous, very mature. The cells have a lot of mucin. Only this funny disorganization of cells and hyperchromasia of nuclei is the uh, given. Um, in a case like this, if you examine the, uh, uh, the, the gallbladder, uh, or the bile duct extensively, 
you often find more convincing clear-cut high-grade dysplasia and even invasive carcinoma. So actually, we are fairly concerned with this um, mucinous or foveolar type dysplasia and this being recognized in the remainder of the GI tract too as an innocuous appearing but disconcerting forms of dysplastic change. So going back to this um, reactive atypia, what we call focal epithelial atypia of healing erosion. Typically, you see these in areas with uh, healing erosion. Um, there's a crescendo maturation, meaning the atypia is more in the base, and as you go to the surface, uh, it loses that, just like in Barrett's. Actually, applying the criteria we apply in Barrett's mucosa is extremely helpful in the gallbladder. Um, as you know, in the um, Barrett's in the esophagus, if there is maturation, we really disregard the uh, significant ATP at the base because regeneration at the base can acquire a tremendous of atypical changes. And same phenomenon also occurs in the gallbladder. So we see this columnar cytology with basophilia at the base. Um, this is more in keeping with the a reactive change. Often they have this intercellular clefts that is uh, telling us that there's some degree of maturation attempt in these cells. That's a helpful clue. Um, in some examples, uh, the crescendo phenomenon is a little bit more evident. You see almost erosion at the surface and uh, collagenous colitis like hyalinization, again, more mature on the surface and more crowded at the base. Mitotic activity is really very prominent, brisk in these types of regenerative areas. So mitosis is not reliable criteria for dysplasia versus reactive atypia. In fact, um, we see mitosis more often in this kind of reactive atypia than uh, the dysplasias itself. Uh, also, one important change is the, when you look at the individual, although these are very basophilic looking areas, when you take out individual nuclei, you will see that they are kind of hypochromatic and their nucleoli, they are there but kind of small basophilic and eccentric, unlike the dysplasias where the nucleoli are significantly prominent and enlarged. Um, it's almost like the prostate basal cells versus prostate adenocarcinoma difference. How often do we encounter this focal basophilic ATP of healing erosion? It occurs in about 10% uh, of gallbladders um, that are totally uh, sampled. So uh, if you sample enough in uh, gallbladder is removed for stones and other injury, um, this kind of regenerative ATP is not actually that uncommon in our experience. Perhaps more um, disconcerting are this kind of changes that occur in the um, areas of hemorrhage and um, erosion and ulceration in the gallbladder. Uh, we see there's uh, prominent red blood cells in the background and nuclei are um, kind of enlarged and nucleoli are prominent. So this could really lead someone to think this could be high grade dysplasia, but actually this is a very typical appearance of uh, severe um, astrophilic atypia uh, that we see in, um, in acute cholecystitis setting. Um, and when we shared this in our consensus meeting, uh, nine of 12 experts called this reactive. Uh, and I agree with that. I think increasing the problem, most of us are really uh, now regarding these as uh, reactive rather than high-grade dysplasia. It's not easy to make the distinction, but the paleness of chromatin and what I call ghost cells, meaning you really have to look for each and every nuclei and finding a hard time catching them. Whereas in true high-grade dysplasia, nucleoli are more um, prominent, more cherry red. This organization is more, um, and again, you don't see the ghosts of nuclei. The nuclei stand out as uh, an uh, meteor eye. Uh, here's another example. Again, uh, reactive ATP here. Um, chromatin is fine and pale. Uh, it looks kind of scary, but actually when you compare it to uh, more conventional high-grade dysplasia, you see the differences. And uh, <clears throat> another challenging aspect of um, uh, surgical pathology in this uh, region is uh, whether we are dealing with high-grade dysplasia CAS that is complex, non-invasive, or is there early invasive carcinoma? And gallbladder, I think, is the most striking um, aspect of this phenomenon. <clears throat> Here we have an example, and we have shared this example with several colleagues from different continents, and I'll come back to that point, and uh, you will see the differences in opinions. Uh, is this invasive, and um, what is the diagnostic stage? Is it um, 
is this um, TIS just in situ carcinoma? Uh, is this a laminopropia invasion? Is this invading to the muscle? Um, or is this even crossing the muscularis and becoming T2 carcinoma? Um, I think we would all agree that there's um, cancerous transformation here, meaning at least in situ carcinoma high grade dysplasia, you contrast the uh, atypical units with um, uh, native glandular elements, you see the striking difference in cytology with nuclear enlargement, disorganization, and all the attributes of carcinomatous change. Um, however, the question is, are these growing within these more native, um, naive glandular units, or is this kind of independent growth of invasive carcinoma? And that becomes a challenging uh, question. And um, the correct answer for this case is, uh, depending on where you live, in which continent you work, you could call this uh, T1A, B, or even T2. Um, and indeed, we when we share this with um, uh, our colleagues from different continents, first of all, most US pathologists would regard this as non-invasive. It's TIS with pegetoid spread to the native glandular units. We don't see convincing invasive carcinoma. Again, you see here native glands with are not uninvolved and this carcinoma inside to is pegetoid is spreading in it is the interpretation in the uh, in the West and in the US, but our Asian and South American colleagues invariably call this T1B or T1C because they are thinking of these as more levels. So this is at the lamina propria level, and this is more in the muscularis level. So it's a little kind of in the deeper location as for them a disconcerting feature. So um, that's the philosophical approach they take. And that's why they call these as invasive carcinoma T1 or T1B carcinomas. So what do we do in such cases? I think the important thing is to perform total sampling and to rule out T2, meaning carcinoma that is, uh, um, penetrating the muscular is proper. Here, another example, um, I'm showing this slide because it illustrates again uh, in another case how porous this muscularis layer is. You know, there's no muscularis mucosa in the in the gallbladder. There's only one layer and that's muscularis, uh, tunica muscularis, and it is very porous. It's not a very continuous compact muscular layer and a lot of invaginations, Ashofrokitansky sinuses or even these glandular proliferations kind of uh, penetrate um, this muscle, um, but actually they're not, uh, they're just normal uh, parts of normal histology. So when carcinoma in situ is seen in this case involve these units, it becomes very difficult to tell whether this is true invasion or so the invasive uh, carcinoma. Uh, so like I said, the important thing in a case like this is to, to do total sampling and rule out T2 carcinoma. And if you rule out T2 carcinoma, you can call this early gallbladder cancer. So it is, um, uh, early gallbladder cancer is a concept that was introduced in high-risk regions like Chile and, and India. Um, instead of trying to struggle whether this is T1A, T1B, this is all cancer confined above the muscularis. So it's early gallbladder cancer. And when you, um, analyze the cases that was sampled entirely and a T2 is ruled out. Actually, these early gallbladder cancers have an excellent prognosis with 10-year survival about 90%, whereas those that are T2 are actually <coughs> uh, much more aggressive, which is not surprising because at the end of the day, uh, T1A, T1B cases are actually like intramucosal adenocarcinomas. They're still kind of in the muscle. Um, it's almost like esophagus and uh, stomach T1, A, T1, B that are very superficial, which almost most of which are uh, cured and curable diseases. And the same concept applies, not surprisingly, to gallbladder, but only if you sampled extensively and ruled out T2 carcinoma. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the literature is based on the SEER data in which this total sampling has not been performed. So uh, more invasive cases have been diagnosed as early gallbladder. So then it it's kind of gets a very different result in terms of the study. But in cases from high-risk regions where total sampling has been done, early gallbladder ca cancer has an excellent prognosis and we have verified that. Actually, not only that, uh, once you break down the um, T2 cancers, meaning those that penetrate the muscle as superficial and more deeper, uh, and we tried that with four different groups, and actually these very superficial minimal invasive cancers behave almost like uh, early gallbladder cancer, again, if you have done total sampling and ruled out deeper cancers. <clears throat> 
So how do we deal with atypia in, in the gallbladder then? Um, and, the <coughs> and bile ducts. Focal epithelial atypia um, or low-grade dysplasia, questionable cases. What we typically do is uh, um, submit four more blocks and try to rule out high-grade dysplasia. If it's only low-grade or this uncertain atypia, it's clinically insignificant. Um, if there's high-grade dysplasia convincing CIS, it's typically wildfire phenomenon. So if it is there, it usually involves most of the preserved epithelium. So um, it's, it's, it's a good thing for us because, again, if it is you you see something it, you should be seeing in a lot of other fossa in most cases, um, and this this should be handled um, with with extensive sampling, rule out invasive T two carcinoma, and if it's on the high grade dysplasia CIS, there's still a small chance this patient will progress in long term follow up, probably due to field effect phenomena. Uh, for T two cancers, we try to give the depth, uh, very superficial ones may do better. Overall, five-year survival is about 45%, so it's an aggressive cancer, but the very minimally invasive ones may do much better than that. So that's why I think documentation of T2 and also documentation of its depth are important aspects of gallbladder cancer reporting. So um, going deeper in the invasiveness, um, the recognition of subtle or what we call minimal deviation adenocarcinomas in the gallbladder and bile ducts um, can be challenging. Here's an example. This was a cholestectomy performed for gallstones. Um, and sections show these glandular elements. So I've shown you hopefully several cases, you've seen how glands can invaginate on the, uh, in the muscularis, there are Shafrakitansky sinuses, a lot of glandular, um, non-invasive glandular, so the invasive glandular penetrations take place. But this particular example was invasive adenocarcinoma. How do we recognize that? This open round lumen formation, attenuation of the epithelium, axis of the glands kind of parallel to the surface rather than perpendicular uh, are the clues that tell us this is actually invasive uh, minimal deviation adenocarcinoma. Um, this is in contrast with uh, Rokitansky Ashov sinuses, as you see here, uh, many of the uh, Ashov Rokitansky sinuses have a kind of a, a spatial distribution that gives you the impression that they're connecting to the surface, their axis is more um, perpendicular to the surface, whereas in this uh, subtle form of invasive endocarcinoma, the cytology is also different. Often these have more columnar cytology and the chain of nuclei you see at the periphery is even evident in low power examination. Whereas in these, you see more open round lumen formation and more attenuation of the cells. Again, subtle, but recognizable form of invasive adenocarcinoma. Uh, by the way, uh, Rokitansky actual sinuses, which this is a very nice example of, again, the connection to the surface, the flask shape is very nice and reliable, the more columnar and the cytologic features are also good for a more benign um, non-carcinomatous process. They can have, however, this desmoplastic-like reaction around them, and they actually often do. So that um, needs to be remembered. This is not desmoplastic reaction of carcinoma. Here's another example. Again, this is Ashov Rokitansky sinus with this peculiar desmoplastic-like stroma around it, uh, which is not uncommon. Here uh, is uh, that uh, it's very subtle form of invasive adenocarcinoma. The nuclei are so bland, perhaps the only way to tell these are the grooves in the nuclei and the cytoplasmic color, the cuboidal nature are also helpful. And this was a perineural invasion by the subtle adenocarcinoma. The context um, is also um, helpful and important. In a completely hyenized uh, gallbladder wall, which we call hyenizing cholestitis, and we're referring to this really complete ionization where the collagen is really replacing the entire layers. And you see this distinctive clad. It's a little bit myoid look in some areas, but essentially the layers are not recognizable otherwise. And these um, clefts are also distinctive. You see glandular elements in the setting. You should worry about endocarcinoma. Here's another example of hyenizing cholecystitis, which is essentially a um, porcelain gallbladder uh, incomplete version. Um, this dense collagenization, no normal layer with this uh, artifactual clefting that's very distinctive. If you see epithelium on the surface, 
you should worry about uh, uh, in situ carcinoma and invasive carcinoma in this context and examine it very carefully. Um, they can be um, quite challenging um, and they often have this um, vanishing gland uh, necrotic changes. Here's an adenocarcinoma arising in hyalinizing cholecystitis. Again, the very distinctive background of hyalinization and these clefts um, and the debris. Uh, can be helpful to the diagnosis and to an extent that actually there are these foci of regression with uh, nuclei, the necrotic nuclei showing almost like a degenerative phenomenon. Here, perhaps the cells with the um, nuclear debris is a little bit more recognizable. Here, calcifications. So you see these patterns, you should examine the case very carefully and rule out invasive carcinoma. Typically, you'll find it to be uh, invasive adenocarcinoma. Here, I would wanted to illustrate some, again, uh, extremely well differentiated adenocarcinoma patterns. Uh, these occur in about 3% you know, uh, uh, of all the other cancers, um, and they can be uh, very challenging if encountered. Here we have the more attenuated examples. They almost look like chondroid syringomas with attenuated uh, epithelium, uh, microcystic uh, appearance. Uh, some of them have more mm, uh, apocryphal snout-like formations uh, resembling tubular carcinomas of the breast. Uh, the foamy gland or um, gastric-like examples are extremely difficult. And here's the example I showed you earlier with more um, uh, attenuated and uh, cystic uh, dilated appearance. So the way to diagnose these uh, variants, uh, some of the helpful clue are, uh, are as follows. Uh, open round lumen formation, as we see here irregular contours of the units, uh, highly variable architectures, glandular debris in the lumen, this kind of almost mucinous gland, uh, the debris with um, cyst-like contents are also very helpful clue to the diagnosis of endocarcinoma. The, the um, parallel axis to the surface uh, with these contour uh, uh, irregularities, again, here's an example of uh, low cuboidal cells with the minimal deviation and no carcinoma. If you see very prominent nucleoli, especially of this kind, it's almost like the ones where we see in prosthetic adenocarcinoma. This is typically a sign of adenocarcinoma. Uh, in the surface I showed you earlier, um, the reactive changes can have nucleoli, but they're not this color and they're not mega nucleoli as, as you see here. Uh, so this should um, lead you to the diagnosis of and no carcinomatous units. In some examples, you won't see nucleoli, but instead, hopefully you will find these really substantial um, amount of groove formation. You see almost every nucleus here is very irregular. And some examples are uh, diagnosable based on these grooves. Grooves are not really a feature of um, reactive epithelium in biliary tract and pancreas. They can occur, but if you see them striking like this, it's probably a um, sign of adenocarcinoma. And some examples really look like papillary thyroid carcinomas. If you look at this, very washed of chromatin, um, nothing else going on in the cells, but this is uh, something that you need to worry about. It's those foamy gland-like or more gastric type uh, infiltration that can be very challenging. I mean, look at this one here. If I showed you just in isolation and I showed this slide earlier too, uh, you would think this is just reactive and almost normal actually, but this is a component of this adenocarcinoma. So when you see the context, some of these things become um, quite easy. I mean, there's obviously an adenocarcinoma here, but when you encounter a gland like this at a margin or a gland like this in just a biopsy, then it becomes very challenging. How do we diagnose this? Um, really, it is a very mature cells. They're, you know, uh, tall columnar appearance. Perhaps the only thing that doesn't fit is we shouldn't have this kind of mucinous epithelium uh, in the gallbladder. And the gallbladder epithelium is um, not secretory like stomach. This is gastric epithelium with the paleness because there's a lot of glycoproteins in it. And um, of course, small intestinal epithelium is much more astrophilic because they're absorptive, they have mitochondria. Here is the gallbladder epithelium. Um, you shouldn't see that much diversion from this. It shouldn't have mucin-like context uh, texture. So if you see more mucinous texture and this clonal appearance of the nuclei, it's something to keep an eye and uh, may prove to be an adenocarcinoma. There are also um, benign glandular proliferations that are very prone to mimic uh, 
invasive adenocarcinomas by both architecture and cytology. Periblary accessory glands that occur uh, on throughout the bile duct system and also at the neck of the gallbladder uh, can be challenging because um, they're often lobulated, but in some examples, you see smaller clusters. And when they acquire atypia, as seen in this case, this was really acute injury um, with some ischemia involved as well. And you can see how atypical they can look. Still, lobulated configuration is maintained to some degree. Uh, none of them is acquiring open round limb information and going on its own. But in isolation, these can be quite challenging. It's important to keep in mind, you can have this pseudo infiltrative, very atypical glandular structures uh, created by injury on these um, accessory mucous glands. Uh, even beyond accessory mucous glands in the, um, in the gallbladder, away from the mucosa, actually in the subserosa and subhepatic surface, especially in the subhepatic area, you see these Lushka's ducts, uh, remnants of the biliary ductules. They do not connect to the surface. They're just remnants from the uh, bile ducts. And um, in normal, they look very innocuous and um, you know, easily recognizable. These are all, again, from the sub hepatic surface, but when they are injured in the context of acute cholecystitis, they can really start to look very infiltrative and atypical. Again, there are about 40 units here. If this was adenocarcinoma, some of the nuclei should really stand out. Again, many of these nuclei are more like ghosts. You barely are, can, uh, you can barely see them. You have to look hard to um, uh, catch the nucleus. And then uh, some of them should have more open round lumen formation. Those are the um, fine criteria that we'll try to use to make this determination. Here's an example in which neutrophilic inflammation also took place in this uh, exosomics glands. Again, in this one, this is, this is very bland nuclei, small. So it is a little bit easier to tell this is reactive rather than um, adenocarcinoma. Ashofrokitansky sinuses, uh, we talked about, they can go deep and often they have smooth contours. Often they look like they are connecting to the surface, flask shapes. Uh, the cytoplasm usually is prominent in columnar. Um, and this also uh, is something that uh, needs to be um, recognized and you need to keep an eye on is if cancerous uh, units uh, or cancerous epithelial cells infiltrate um, pagetoidly involve these Ashofrokitansky sinuses, they can look really invasive. Here's one example. We see the more native normal epithelium and then this plastic cells vegetatively spreading into these. And you can get the impression that you may be dealing with invasive adenocarcinoma. It gets quite difficult to make that distinction. And pneumomas occur in about 9% of gallbladders. So it's something to keep in mind. Some of them uh, rarely give rise to uh, dysplastic and carcinomatous changes, I, as I illustrated earlier. Um, they themselves can look like infiltrative units, but when you look at it in low power, the organization, the submucosal uh, nodule, mural nodule formation, with these kind of irregular glands that are kind of fitting together in an organoid fashion, often the muscle is um, centrally located or towards the lumen. Um, they kind of look like they're converging into one pinpoint focus in the mucosa. This is, we believe these are malformative lesions. Um, so they are um, relatively easy to recognize as just part of the adenomyoma if you pay attention to the uh, architectural uh, features of this entity. However, like I said, they can give rise to cancers as well. Here's one example in which um, high-grade dysplasia and invasive carcinoma focus uh, was detected incidentally. So they need to be examined carefully as well. Um, so in summary for these um, subtle invasive adenocarcinomas, um, uh, it is important uh, to recognize the context. Um, just like in the rest of the pancreas and biliary tract, um, invasive adenocarcinomas can be uh, very well differentiated appearing, uh, minimal deviation or adenoma malignum pattern, if you will. Uh, so we have to rely on other subtle features the context is important. I mentioned porcelain or hyalinizing cholecystitis setting. In that setting, you need to examine the glands a lot more carefully uh, and even look for those granular debris and calcifications, et cetera. And for uh, other minimal deviation endocarcinomas, I illustrated um, the prominence of nucleoli, the grooves, uh, maybe papillary thyroid carcinoma-like look, but more commonly those 
microcystic pattern with debris in them, the mucin-like or nuclear debris in them with dilated open round lumen formation and um, attenuated cells. Those are the features we look for to make the diagnosis of adenocarcinoma. Uh, and it's essentially the diversion from the normal is what we're looking for. And that's why it's important to uh, really look at these organs carefully as much as possible to appreciate the spectrum of normal so that you can uh, recognize the more subtle uh, aspects of cancerous changes uh, in these sites. Uh, and that concludes my talk. And I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the research team that I work very closely with. Um, most of the data I present to you are the products of their hard work and also international collaborations with our colleagues from Chile, United States, Korea, and uh, several other countries. And I also would like to thank our team at uh, Koch University. Uh, it's been a fantastic experience, a wonderful time uh, working with them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Adse, for that excellent talk on uh, biliary neoplasias. And uh, I'm sure our viewers have uh, really enjoyed your talk. Uh, there are quite a few questions from our viewers. Uh, let me read them for you. Can you hear me well, Dr. Adse? Yes, I can hear you. Thanks, Rafa. Uh, can you unmute yourself, please? I did, actually. Um, let me read them for you. Can you hear me now? Okay, all right. So the first question is, uh, how to recognize bill in high grade extending into Rokitansky sinuses versus invasive carcinoma? What is your experience? I think you yeah. explained it, yeah. Yeah, for that actually, uh, unfortunately in the biliary tract and in the pancreas, we do not have uh, the brown stains to help us. There's no second layer like basal layer or myepithelial layer that we can show a, a non-invasive unit and determine invasiveness. So we really have to rely on the architecture, the morphology, the distribution, and all. That's why I wanted to go in deeper and more detailed on the um, uh, on the subtle invasive adenocarcinomas to show their features with dilatation, interluminal debris, and other features that we we'll look for to determine invasiveness. Um, and I saw in that question, there was also a question whether it is kind of different regions. So does it really matter? Um, like I said, it may not matter if you call it early gallbladder cancer, whether it's T1A, T1B, minimally invasive or not, because that's very small invasive carcinoma, a fraction of a millimeter we are talking about. And um, th those are really not uh, consequential, provided that you do extensive sampling and rule out T2 carcinoma, because then the prognosis is very different. Right. Thank you, Dr. Adse. There is another question. Uh, someone else added uh, onto that previous question that uh, is stromal reaction a helpful feature in such situations? What's your comment? Yeah, stromal reaction, unfortunately, as again, I tried to uh, show that even Rokitansky Rok Asho sinuses have that desmoplastic-like, actually it looks really like a desmoplasia. So that, is, that doesn't help as much. And many, um, and conversely, many ordinary gallbladder adenocarcinomas do not generate desmoplastic reaction, especially when they're in the muscularis layer. Deeper in the uh, perimuscular soft tissue, they often have some collagenous reactions, but that's not quite the desmoplasia that we see, for instance, in the pancreas cancers. So relying only on the stromal changes uh, can be misleading. It's often not there, and it is also present in benign conditions. So we, again, rely on the architecture, the distribution, the cytology, other um, features of the units themselves. Right. Now, I, I like your comment that you say that uh, there is a space-like situation when you see the Rokitansky sinuses, even though they are lying deeper and you see dysplasia there, right? Maybe that's a practical clue that you mentioned. Right, exactly. 
So the next question is, how do we differentiate between ICPN and pyloric gland adenoma? Is it important to differentiate or it's just a matter of terminology or are there any prognostic significance, any immunostains that might help? Yeah, no, I don't think there's any uh, significance in calling something. If you have a collection of pyloric glands and it's not a metaplasia, meaning it's really one, two centimeter clonal appearing tumor that is like the ones described in the GI tract, meaning it's really forming a mass um, and it doesn't have high grade dysplasia, you can call it ICPN or pyloric gland type, or you can just call it pyloric gland adenoma. The key there is to do sampling of the uh, uninvolved gallbladder as well, and rule out invasive carcinoma or high-grade dysplasia, uh, not only in that particular area, but elsewhere in the gallbladder. And I saw another question uh, uh, regarding how many sections to take from the uninvolved gallbladders um, in cases with these papillary polypoid lesions. Um, well, we go at least four or five blocks from uninvolved sections. Um, like with ICPNs, often the entire mucosa is involved, often, not always. But if it's a localized lesion, um, then we would do at least four or five sections from the uninvolved gallbladder, especially abnormal looking gallbladder. You, it, it really is a must. And it, even that may be an undersampling because we've seen cases, they have very subtle invasion that looks almost normal mucosa somewhere else in the gallbladder. So, needs to be kept an eye on. Right. Thank you, Dr. Adze. Uh, so here is another question. But I would assume that these papillary slash cystic lesions are mostly visible on gross. Any gu guideline on just how many sections on a normal appearing gallbladder on gross? Yeah, that's actually, that's what I was referring to indeed. Um, these are really by definition visible because you're seeing this polypoid papillary lesion. Um, Yes, and from the uninvolved gallbladder, it's, it's important. I mean, you put, you, we should examine the entire lesional tissue, but from uninvolved gallbladder, uh, at least four or five blocks is, is required. And often even more probably. Right. I think you have mentioned this in a couple of your papers uh, on how many sections are enough in a gallbladder. Uh, so there is this thing. Rufat, if I can say one thing, I often find myself, um, I try to be the moderate in that. So um, like in many uh, consensus manuscripts from academic centers, uh, like in IPMNs, for instance, or MCNs of pancreas, you know, uh, my name is on papers that say you have to put the whole thing in. I don't quite agree with that. Uh, that's kind of an overkill. So that's why we do more stepwise and more practical approach because for practicing pathologists, putting 200 blocks is expensive and a difficult end hour. But on the other hand, on the other hand, it's also important to realize, you know, missing that small invasive carcinoma could be detrimental for this patient. So in an era that we are putting 50 blocks for atypical ductal hyperplasia of the breast, I think it's fully justified to do extensive sampling of these biliary gallbladder lesions, really, for the sake of the patient. Yeah, this is a very, this is very correct and pertinent. I think we have viewers from so many different parts of the world, including where the gallbladder carcinoma is prevalent. Like I saw viewers from Chile as well as India. I mean, in my place where I'm from, the northeastern India, so the gallbladder cancer is very, really, very much prevalent and it's high. And how many sections to be submitted is really very important question. And I think uh, you're right. So this is a, another question from a viewer. So I see intestinal metaplasia in good number of cholecystic specimens for cholelithiasis. Uh, does it require, a, uh, sorry, so does it, uh, is it associated with any significance clinically and uh, are they associated with low grade or high grade dysplasia? And on the same line, so again, the question of how many sections one should submit additionally if there is presence of intestinal metaplasia in a cholecystic specimen for stone. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's indeed. Um, I guess the, um, one of the answers to this question is uh, where do you live? Uh, just like Dr. Manan uh, Rufat said, if you're in a very high risk region like Chile or uh, India, any abnormality you may have to take much more seriously because these are heralds of abnormality and there's genetic tendency or other local uh, geographic factors with high incidence of cancer, you need to be more alert. For instance, uh, Juan Carlos Roa, who I work very closely with from Chile, uh, he often tells me, so 
this kind of ATP, and you're going to take just four more sections in Chile, we would have to put the entire thing through. And he's right there. It's probably justified to do that. But in very low risk regions like United States and Europe and parts of Europe, it may not be justifiable to do the whole thing. So we actually wrote a paper with um, Olja Basturk and Juan Carlos Roa in histopathology last year. We tried to address the sampling um, criteria or sample which for which lesion would do what, what kind of sampling. Uh, it's not really data-based, uh, some of them. It's more kind of uh, balancing different approaches, at least at the current practice. Um, so you, if you want, you can check that. I don't like advertising uh, publications, but we, uh, we really tried to come up with some guidelines in that paper for this purpose. Right, intestinal uh, metaplasia, by the way, in our practice, what we do is we see intestinal metaplasia, goblet cells, we take four more sections. This is our practice, just to make sure we don't, we're not dealing with a dysplastic lesion. If you don't see anything else, we stop there. If we start to see true dysplasia, then we go further. That's our approach in, uh, in our practice. Right. I think this is a very important advice for people uh, practicing uh, pathology in India as well. Like, uh, uh, where if we see more intestinal metaplasia or maybe like uh, pyloric type metaplasia in those areas, so we probably should be more liberal and submit more sections from that goal yeah. other. Right. In intestinal metaplasia, in our experience, have a little bit of association, just like in the stomach, a little bit stronger association with carcinomatous changes. And even some dysplasias have goblet cells in them. So there's there must be something there. But for pyloric gland metaplasia, it is, it's so common in chronic cholecystitis and stuff. I'm not sure it justifies to do anything further as much. For right. intestinal metaplasia, like I said, our protocol is four more blocks. Right. Thank you. And so uh, there are a lot of questions on that regard. So, I mean, I, I, I would, and you have already addressed uh, some of those. So that do we need all gold bladder for low-grade dysplasia or only four blocks are good as mentioned? Should we give reference in our report? Yeah, uh, no, for uh, again, low grades, from what we learned from early gallbladder cancer data, meaning those T1A, T1B, TIS type cases, that they are mostly curable. That teaches us that high grade dysplasia is worrisome because they are not all curable, but mostly curable. Some come back. So, high grade dysplasia we take seriously, but extrapolating from that, low grade dysplasia we really think doesn't have much clinical consequence. Low-grade dysplasia is usually iffy, it's hard to recognize, it's subjective, it's often focal. So we, like I said, we do four more sections and we debate whether it's high-grade or not. If your comis is not high-grade, it's we think it's time to stop and doesn't require any, any further. And again, if for a reference, again, this is not very data-based, but at least experience-based, um, and it's in our paper that we uh, we put together uh, last year with Ra and Olja. Right. Uh, so the next question is uh, somewhat related, but uh, the question says that uh, if a pathologist misses dysplasia uh, or a carcinoma in case of xanthogranulomatous cholecystitis, how often does that happen? Uh, yeah, the xanthogranulomatous cholecystitis is an interesting entity. When you look at the literature, you will see that it it mimics cancer clinically and radiologically. And sometimes cancers pop up in things that are called xanthogranulomatous cholecystitis. But, you know, I think we need to look at things in, from pathology perspective. If there's carcinoma, there's carcinoma. Xanthogranulomatous cholecystitis is, is often there accidentally. By the way, there was another question about cholecystitis and whether we use the same criteria in cholecystitis. I have to tell you, most dysplasias and cancers in Chile are in association with cholelithiasis, uh, with, uh, with gallstones. So yes, when you have gallstones, we apply exactly these criteria. Most of our um, cancerous changes occur in gallstone-ridden gallbladders. So uh, you cannot say, oh, I have gallstones, so I'm gonna decrease my threshold. Um, that's not quite the right thing to do. So yes, with gallstones, we have these cancerous uh, changes and that's how we deal with that. Right, right. Yeah, you have already addressed that question. So uh, regarding endemicity, here is this question that is it really where you are practicing or actually where the patient you are dealing with might be from? Yes, of course. You know, that's a great question. Um, of course, you know, you may have a Chilean that's being operated in the United States or in Turkey. Uh, and then what happens? So we don't know the answer to some of these questions. There are a lot of studies we're conducting in collaboration with uh, Jill Koshil from NIH and uh, uh, colleagues from Korea and uh, Chile. Uh, what are the reasons 
is it uh, local factors or is it genetic predisposition? Probably both in play. So um, the, the thing is, though, you know, you often in other countries, like in the US, we see a lot of, you know, South American patients, but you don't often know the background and stuff. So you have to develop kind of um, uh, a guideline for your overall population. Since the incidence is lower, it's okay to do lesser sampling, perhaps. Um, but the question is very accurate, very important. It's probably both genes and the local factors that come together to um, cause this high risk regions. Uh, so in some patients, it may be uh, even in, when they move to other um, locale, they may develop cancers um, based on their genes, for sure. Uh, here is the next question is, are there any subtle macroscopic changes of the gallbladder that should prompt one to do extensive sampling, not just the regular blocks? Oh, I'm so glad this question is asked because I had slides for this and I took it out for time constraints. Um, the answer is absolutely not. And I can tell you, uh, Juan Carlos will be very proud of me. Uh, even in Chile, where they see so many gallbladder cancers, they tell me they just cannot recognize about 40 to 60% of the gallbladder cancers that they diagnose, grossly, they cannot hide, identify the tumor. That's why, you know, they actually, they do mapping and root total sampling in all of their gallbladders that have any, any abnormality. So uh, unfortunately, um, even worse than pancreas, uh, invasive cancer can be very invisible. Um, that's why sampling becomes much more crucial when you have a herald lesion, like papillary lesion, you have interdysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, then you have to go through. And you have to also remember gallbladder wall is very thin, it's two millimeters. So seeing a cancer that is crossed the uh, two millimeter is, is not really easy. So it, uh, sampling is crucial. Right. Uh, one of our viewer wants to know, how do you deal with dysplasia at the cystic duct margin? Oh, um, so the answer is twofold. Low grade dysplasia will probably ignore as we do in general for it's probably not significant. You have high grade dysplasia in a case with convincing high grade dysplasia in the gallbladder, we would worry. Um, there are no good re uh, answers as to what to do with them if it is detected incidentally. Uh, what we typically recommend is close follow-up of those patients because one thing we know is if there's high convincing high grade dysplasia carcinoma in situ in the gallbladder, then the biliary tract, the rest of the biliary tract is at some risk. About five to 10% of these patients come back with biliary tract cancers in long-term follow-up. It's not a trivial number. So we're talking about every, every 20 case. Um, that's why close follow-up is important. And especially if this is at the cystic duct margin, then that follow-up becomes even more crucial. And in that follow-up, if they do uh, additional surgery, we recommend they do, and we have done this many times now, they do command, we recommend they do uh, brushing of both upper and lower biliary tract for baseline to look for dysplastic lesions. It's not easy to evaluate. You will hear a wonderful talk from uh, uh, Dr. Reed in a few minutes. Uh, she will tell you um, the diagnosis and cytology, but we recommend doing that to screen the patient in a way, right. if there's an operation. Right. On the same line, one of our viewers wants to know that actually how important is sampling of the neck margin, even in the absence of uh, a dysplasia? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Well, the, the way we do it is, again, in low-risk regions, it probably becomes a, a nuisance. In high-risk regions, we recommend this very strongly to be done. In our uh, current practice, the way we um, uh, process gallbladder is we take a full thickness from going from fundus all the way to neck, but we take the neck as a separate round structure and put it in the same cassette. So it's one cassette is the random section, only one, but that cassette includes the cystic duct margin as amphas. In case something pops up, then we have that, that fragment to evaluate and go back. So because you suddenly find high grade dysplasia, and it's too late to say, whoops, where was the cystic duct margin, et cetera. So we, in routine practice for random section, we we'll take a piece of the cystic duct amphas and put it in, a, in our cassette, in the original cassette. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, is papillary adenocarcinoma slash cholangiocarcinoma now classified as ICPN slash IPNB? Yes, absolutely. Um, many of the case now we call ICPN. Um, 
used to be called papillary adenocarcinomas. Um, that term needs to go away because it's very confusing um, because we need to think level-wise, TIS, T1, T2, um, and that papillary adenocarcinoma was blurring that concept. So in pancreatic biliary tract, any part of the pancreatic biliary tract, and inside to papillary carcinoma, intramucosal mucosal growth that is pre-invasive and non-invasive process is called um, tumoral intraepithelial neo, ICPN, IPMN, IPME in that group. Of right. course, there are polypoid invasive carcinomas, meaning a cancer can form a pop as, as, as an invasive process can form. We're not talking about those. We're talking about pre-invasive, um, non-invasive papillary neoplasms should be considered under ICPN, IPMB, et cetera. Yes. Right. Uh, the next question is, is there a way to differentiate pesicoid spread of high-grade dysplasia slash in situ carcinoma in invasinating gland versus a true invasive carcinoma? Or is this really just a matter of collective experience in certain regions? I think you yeah, as we, answered. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, as we mentioned, you know, there are no brown stains to tell what's invasive and non-invasive. We have to rely on um, the patterns and cytology. And if it is very minimal, T1A versus not, is again, that early gallbladder cancer concept takes care of that. The thing to do is to rule out to true T2 carcinomas in that setting. Right. Thank you. Uh, so... This question is uh, from one of our viewers. Like, how do you report multifocal polypoid high-grade dysplasia in a patient with FAP? Do you have any experience? And one assumes that the entire specimen needs to be submitted. Yeah, um, FAP, I, honestly, I have not seen FAP. Uh, we, we've seen all kinds of syndromes in gallbladder and bile ducts, but FAP somehow didn't come to my attention. They usually form duodenal ampullary. We see a lot of FAP patients in my institution and ampullary and duodenal FAP lesions, uh, we have numerous. Um, and those we really do extensive sampling, careful sampling, uh, but in upper biliary tract and gallbladder, I, I have not witnessed, I have not seen a case of that sort. Um, I don't think the patients made that make that far. You know, they develop colon cancer by the age of 30. If they survive that, they develop duodenal ampullary cancer by the age of 40, 50, unfortunately. And um, biliary lesions don't quite come to attention uh, uh, most patients. So I don't have experience with that. We have seen an IPMM patient in an FAP, FAP case. And of course you do tell total sampling with that. Right now I can share my experience recently. And uh, uh, there was a recent case, like when a colleague of mine showed me a gallbladder that uh, which was debatable for subtle low grade dysplasia. And uh, I thought that, okay, if there is low grade dysplasia, like at least uh, we are obligated to uh, submit more sections or rather the entire gallbladder. We probably went a little more extensive, but, and I did not know the history of the patient. And it so happened that in the, in the subsequent sections, there were multiple foci of high-grade dysplasia, which was polypoid, multi, multifocal, but there was no invasive carcinoma. So, and uh, then we were discussing, maybe these patients have some, some uh, situation that is going on, why otherwise uh, this is happening. And we found out that this patient actually had FAP. But oh, there well, was, yeah. we, we submitted the whole gallbladder, but there was no invasive carcinoma. Right. I mean, it's reported clearly in other syndromes too. And we know HMPCC, for instance, we see uh, Lynch is actually a predisposing factor for uh, gallbladder cancers, uh, not uncommon. And um, there are a lot of uh, different uh, um, syndromes that occur, metachromatic local dystrophy that predisposes to ICPNs. And I mentioned pancreatic biliary maljunction causes multifocal papillary um, polypoid lesions. Uh, so there are a lot of different conditions that uh, predispose to that indeed. Right. I think uh, these are all the questions mostly that uh, I saw and many of the questions uh, you have answered already. So I have not repeated them. And thank you so much again, Dr. Adse for this very uh, illuminating talk on a topic which is not much discussed and it is so practically important for our colleagues and all of us practicing in different parts of the world. And you would be happy to know, Dr. Adse, that uh, the talk was viewed by over 200 pathologists, I'm sure, for our trainees from different parts of the world. And I could keep track of viewers from so many different countries, including, of course, there were people from Chile who joined, uh, from India, Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Philippines, Dominican Republic, Somalia, Croatia, 
a lot of viewers from Turkey, of course. I mean, there were a lot from Turkey who joined in that I could see. And thank you so much again, Dr. Radzi, uh, for your time and effort. And thanks to Pancreatability Pathology Society for organizing and helping us to organize this uh, lecture for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Rufat. Thank you, Emilio, and thank you, PPBS, for inviting me. And uh, thanks for all of you joining in uh, and asking these great questions. Uh, I hope this was helpful and it will help you in uh, in your practice with gallbladder and bile ducts. Take care. Thank you.